from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. I know your program says Kevin Sullivan, who should have been here to introduce Ben, who's a good friend of Ben's. Um, but Kevin is a reporter for the Washington post, and so he was called off to the hurricane in Texas, and uh, in, in quite perilous conditions is, um, is covering that uh, devastating flood for, for the paper and for, for our benefit. Um, so my name is Maria Rana, uh, and I am the literary director of this festival. It's a wonderful festival. I've been doing this for 17 years. How about you? I mean, are you, are, are, are you having a good time? <laughs> How many of you are here for the first time? Oh, welcome, welcome, and uh, may you come back. Uh, how many of you are here for, for the last five years? Wonderful, and for the last 17? A few hands, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for supporting uh, the festival. And uh, there is a better way to support it, and that is through your donations. This is a, a free and public event, and we can only do it if you support it. So I hope you will consider doing that. Um, ben will have a Q&A after his talk. And um, it's such a real a thrill to be standing here introducing um, Ben McIntyre. Congratulations for having the good judgment to come to this session because you are in for a very big treat. Um, he's a marvelous storyteller whose book after book after book have engaged many readers beyond his native England. Um, I am certainly an ardent fan. Uh, it's, a, it's really a, a great pleasure to, to, to welcome him here and, and to um, have had him cross the Atlantic to come and be with us today. So now to the books. Um, the title of Ben McIntyre's most recent book, Rogue Heroes, tell us a, tells us a great deal about the people and the events and themes that interest him the most. He recognizes and honors genuine heroism on the infrequent occasions when it occurs, but he also delights in rogues, especially rogues who become spies. He has a soft spot for the odd, the unconventional, the shameless, and yes, larcenous. All the better when the scoundrel turns out to be a hero. Well, a hero of sorts. So it is that Adam Worth, the hero of the Napoleon of crime, not merely engineers epic thefts on an international scale. He steals Gainsborough's great portrait of Georgiana, the alluring Duchess of Devonshire, and hides it away for a full two decades, maintaining her as his private pinup girl. And so it is that Kim Philby, the notorious double agent, emerges in McIntyre's superb a spy among friends as amoral, but irresistibly charming, loved by his closest friends, even as he betrays them and his country. And so it is that Agent Zigzag, the petty criminal Eddie Chapman becomes in World War II, a double agent whose service to England plays a crucial part in the struggle against Nazi Germany, yet who remains a rogue and a scoundrel right up to the rather glorious end. And finally, so it is, that in Rogue Heroes, a small band of British officers and men refuses to play by the rules of warfare, forming the Special Air Service, parachuting behind enemy lines, unheard of at the time, and doing damage far out of proportion to their numbers. All of these stories are true, like the stories in his other books, yet all are told by McIntyre with flair and suspense, that is, that his friend David Cornwell, the great novelist John le Carré, surely admires and perhaps even envies. It is your turn now to fall under Ben McIntyre's spell. Ben.
Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for that uh, really lovely introduction. Um, I don't know quite why I always write about people who are either mad or dangerous or crooked or in some way kind of off-center, but it does seem to be a kind of, it's a habit I can't break, actually. Um, rogue heroes. Special forces, like your own Delta Force and Navy SEALs and the SAS, have a particular hold on our public imagination. Of the military, they attract more imagination, more admiration, more speculation, and more downright fantasy than any part of the sort of military establishment. Um, this is largely because they are mysterious. They cultivate, all of these um, groups cultivate an air of secrecy. Um, and that is sort of part of the way that they sell themselves. So when I was asked three years ago whether I was willing to write the authorized um, book about the SAS, um, it took me about eight seconds to say yes. Um, because what it meant was access to their secret archive, um, which I can't even tell you where it is, in fact. Um, but, and to describe it as an archive is rather to dignify what is actually um, really just a set of enormous cardboard boxes stuffed with paper. Um, and not just paper, it, it, the archives contain letters, diaries, memos, postcards, but also parachutes, guns, uniforms, because the SAS is so secret that uh, towards the end of the war, when they were sort of gathering everything together, they simply just hid it away in these boxes. And as an archive, it's irresistible because the SAS itself doesn't really know what's in it. Um, and uh, they did, in fact, digitize um, the, the entire archive for me. It was about a million and a half pages, a million, uh, 1.5 million pages. And some poor uh, soldier who had signed up to strangle people uh, in Iraq had to spend about a year digitizing this thing. He ended up absolutely hating me. Um, <laughs> I approached the, the, the task with some trepidation because I, I wondered whether the SAS would try to control what I wrote, whether they would try to take you know, the less creditable parts of the story out. Uh, I was assured that they wanted a warts and all book, and that's what they got. There are more warts in this story than I expected, and I think a great deal more than they expected. But to their credit, they never tried uh, to take them out. And of course, the SAS is a vital part of all of our history, because all special forces units, um, which are now, of course, a completely accepted element of all modern warfare, the idea that you have small, highly trained uh, units that will operate covertly behind the lines, both to gather intelligence and to hit high-value strategic targets. That is now an absolutely accepted part of military thinking. It wasn't always that way, and it began with um, a very unlikely group of people. Um, I had come to the SAS, I mean, I think we all have a sort of image of special forces, of highly trained, very efficient, very fit people carrying out the sort of jobs that, that most of us would, would never want to do. Um, the reality is both much more, certainly historically, the reality is much more complex and much more interesting than that. The original SAS was highly eccentric, deeply diverse. It was peopled by oddballs, people, uh, soldiers who wouldn't fit into a conventional army. The original SAS was in many ways a kind of ragtag private army. Um, some of the early SAS were clever and tough, but others were extremely sensitive of no more than average strength and fitness, and yet courageous in other very unexpected ways. Many were brutally hardened by the experience of behind-the-lines warfare and became more so as the war advanced. Some never recovered from the experience of this kind of warfare, and some were borderline psychotic. Um, this didn't turn out to be, as I had expected it to be, a kind of traditional regimental history. Instead, it sort of turned into a kind of study of human behavior, how ordinary men behave in extraordinary conditions of warfare. Um, and I discovered many things about the SAS which I had never known before, including the fact that it was very nearly disbanded at birth and would only really have survived, uh, would not have survived, in fact, without the personal intervention of Winston Churchill himself. 
Now, the SAS was dreamed up by a, a young British officer called David Sterling. Uh, now, Sterling um, came up with the idea of the SAS, the Special Air Service, while he was convalescing from a failed parachute jump uh, in the North African desert in 1941. Um, if I just qu quickly tell you how that accident happened, it'll give you a little bit of the flavor of what Sterling was like. Um, he was bored to death in, in North Africa. He had signed up for the commandos, but wasn't seeing nearly as much action as he wanted. Uh, and so he stole a set of parachutes uh, from a dock in Suez, borrowed a plane that was completely inappropriate for what he wanted to do. And then he and a couple of friends simply tied the rip cords of the parachutes to the chair legs inside the plane, opened the door and jumped out. Um, the problem was, as I said, that the plane was the wrong sort of plane, and Sterling's own parachute snagged on the tail fin, and he plummeted uh, to earth at roughly four times the recommended speed and did his back in. Um, but while lying in hospital in Cairo, he came up with a very simple but very singular idea. He worked out that because at that point of the war, that I should probably give you a little strategic idea of where we were, Obviously, America was not yet in the war, but the Eighth Army, the British Eighth Army, was sort of encamped at Cairo uh, in, the, in the eastern part of, of the Western Desert. And the Italian and German armies were encamped in the West. And it was a kind of moment of stasis, really. Nobody was moving. Um, and the Germans and Italians controlled all the airfields along the northern strip, uh, the single road that runs along the coast of North Africa. So Sterling worked out that if he could parachute into the desert and, as it were, this vast Libyan desert, and as it were, creep up behind the enemy, they could attack the airfields, blow up as many planes as they possibly could in the shortest space of time, and then effectively run away back into the desert. Um, it, it sounds like a simple idea, and indeed it was, but in many ways it was completely revolutionary because Many of the middle-ranking officers at that point had a very static idea of how war is fought. This came from the First World War. The idea was that two large armies will meet in a large space and fight it out until one of them wins. What Sterling was recommending was completely different and very revolutionary. Amazingly, he got permission to start recruiting, and he set about doing this uh, in a very particular way. He was looking for people who were unconventional. He was looking for people who didn't really stick by the rules, and he got them. One of his earliest recruits was a man called Paddy Main, who was a Northern Irishman uh, with an explosive temper and a serious drink problem and a capacity for raw and frequently unconstrained violence. Um, he probably destroyed more planes than anybody else during the Second World War, any fighter pilot on either side, uh, but he blew them up all entirely on the ground. Um, Another key recruit was a man called Jock Lewis, who was a, a, an Oxford-educated um, intellectual, really, with sort of matinee looks. Um, but he was also a very clever man, and he invented a, a particular kind of bomb, which is still called a Lewis bomb, which was a kind of rustic, uh, handheld time bomb. Um, I particularly love this painting by Rex Whistler because it shows, um, uh, it, it shows Lewis training at, at Sandown Racecourse in Britain, uh, which is one of the big racecourses in Britain. You can actually see the horses sort of coming up uh, behind him, and he's holding a Bren gun, and it looks exactly as if he's about to start mowing down the runners and riders in the 350. Um, another key recruit was a man called Reg Seekings, uh, who was a foul-mouthed, one-eyed boxer from Cambridge. Um, who had a sort of gift for killing, really. Uh, he was able to do so without remorse. He, wa he described himself as a rough, tough so-and-so. Uh, most people thought he was a complete maniac. But he was the sort of person that you actually wanted on your side in a war like this. Um, his closest friend was a man called Johnny Cooper. Um, Cooper was actually 17. He was too young to join uh, the SAS. He lied about his age to get in. And um, this is a rather typical photograph of, of Cooper. There are lots of photographs in the SAS archive and lots of uh, photographs in the book. One of the things the SAS uh, was very good at was taking photographs of themselves. Um, <laughs> it's, it's almost as if they, they knew that they were going to become extremely famous after the war, and so they, um, they might as well capitalize on it. But every photo, I mean, Cooper was an extraordinary man. I mean, he fought through every single one of the worst campaigns that took place uh, that the SAS fought during the Second World War. And he has a broad grin on his face in every single photograph. Um, 
And Sterling himself, you see him here again, is a most unlikely candidate to lead what would become a, a famously fit fighting force. He was tall, stooped, he had a bad back, um, he had conjunctivitis, he had desert sores, he was very unfit, um, he drank too much, he smoked all the time. Um, and yet he had one very particular talent, which was that he had a, a real gift for for identifying the sort of characters that he wanted. And in a way, it was a little like a sort of dirty dozen operation. Um, Sterling went around picking up people that he thought would fit the bill. He said, I didn't want psychopaths. Um, he got a few psychopaths, but he, he, wanted, he wanted people who were unconventional, who were able to think laterally, but who could also be, when necessary, completely ruthless. Um, he began training them at Kabrit in, in Egypt. They were trained in unarmed combat, in, in, in long-term desert survival techniques, and in particular, in, in parachuting. Now, Sterling believed that a very good way to train for parachuting is to jump out of the back of a speeding truck at 40 miles an hour. Um, this is actually not a good way to train for parachuting because you're going horizontally and not vertically. But it is a very, very good way to break your legs, which quite a number of trainees, in fact, did. Uh, um, these, this was very tough training, um, and indeed two died uh, while, while, while training for the first operation, which was called Operation Squatter. And it took place in November 1941. It involved 55 parachutists. And the idea, as I say, was really pretty simple. They would parachute into the desert. They would then sneak up behind the, the, ro the, the sort of aligned airfields, blow up as many planes as they could, and then escape. Um, it was an unmitigated catastrophe. Uh, these parachutists jumped into the teeth of what was the worst gale, the worst storm in the area for 30 years. Uh, most of them landed miles off target. Uh, many became completely disorientated and lost in the desert at night. Uh, some were actually scraped to death on the desert floor because the high, in the high winds they couldn't unclip their parachutes. And, and a couple were so badly wounded uh, by the fall that they simply had to be abandoned and died of thirst in the desert. Of the 55 parachutists that went in on Operation Squatter, um, 23 came back. Uh, they straggled back to a rendezvous in the desert with uh, the long-range desert group, the LRDG. These were the Desert Reconnaissance Intelligence Unit whose task it was to drive across the 500-mile Libyan desert and spy on the, 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 the troops moving, moving along the, the coastal road. They were brilliant desert navigators. They, they'd worked out uh, incredible techniques for getting across the desert. And they were the ones who took uh, the survivors of the first SAS operation back out again. Um, now, instead of this leading to the immediate disbanding of this operation, uh, and Sterling actually, interestingly, never really reported on, on quite what a disaster it had been. I, I read his report on Operation Squatter, and it's a miracle of economy. Um, uh, he just says, you know, didn't go terribly well, we're getting on with the next one. Um, <laughs> But as a result of it, uh, he hit on a very simple idea, which was that if the LRDG, if these truck-borne, truck and, and jeep-borne uh, troops could get into the desert and take them out, then they could bring them in in the first place. Um, and that would obviously obviate the need to jump out of planes with parachutes in the middle of the night. Um, quite why this glaringly obvious solution uh, to a quite simple problem had not occurred to anyone before is one of the great mysteries of the SAS story. Um, but it was, a, it was a real turning point for the SAS because it made them highly mobile. And they began in alliance, the SAS and the LRDG, to carry out a whole series of lightning raids on airfields. They blew up hundreds of them uh, and then escaped back into the desert. I mean, one of the things that I learned in writing this book is that it requires a particular cast of mind, and, and sometimes that cast of mind has to be particularly brutal. I, I mentioned at the beginning Paddy Main, the Irish rugby player. Um, there was one handwritten document I found in the archive that is actually very chilling, and it's a description by Paddy Main of an assault that was made on, a, on an airfield called Tamit. Um, and it, it goes roughly like this. Um, they got onto the airfield, they noticed, they planted their bombs, 
and they were sneaking off without having been picked up by the sentries when they spotted in the corner of the airfield a, a hut with a light coming from under the door and they realized that sort of party was taking place inside. Italian and German officers were having, having, a, having a ball inside. Uh, and this is, I'll just read it to you very briefly, Maine's description of what happened next. Uh, I kicked open the door and stood there with my Colt 45, the others at my side with a Tommy gun and another automatic. The Germans just stared at us. We were a peculiar and frightening sight, bearded and with unkempt hair. For what seemed like an age, we just stood there and looked at each other in complete silence. Then I said, good evening. And at that, a young German arose and moved slowly backwards. I shot him. I turned and fired at another some six feet away. The room was by now in pandemonium. Then they barricaded the doors. They rolled in hand grenades and barricaded the doors. At least 30 people were killed that night in what even Sterling was, was shocked by what he called a, a callous execution in cold blood. Paddy Main was really, in, in some ways, a kind of trained killer. Um, but alongside people like Maine were others, no less brave, but of a very different kind of martial bent. One of my favorites in this story is a man called Fraser McCluskey, who called himself the Parachute Padre. Um, and he was the first chaplain of the SAS, and he took part in all of the toughest assignments that they were on. He never carried a gun. And he exuded a kind of a, an astonishing sort of moral force that had a great impact on the regiment. Um, Life expectancy in the early SAS was extremely short um, because having planted these bombs, they then had to escape and uh, as sun would come up, any surviving planes from uh, the airfields would then go hunting for the SAS and this appalling game of cat and mouse would take place in the desert. Um, this is the last known photograph of Jock Lewis who was attacked with his convoy on Christmas Eve 1941. Uh, he was hit by a Stuka uh, shell. Uh, which, uh, which blew his leg off, and he bled to death uh, very, very swiftly. And he is buried somewhere in the, in the, in the Western Desert. No one has ever found his remains. Um, the men of L Detachment, they called themselves L Detachment SAS. Sterling used to joke that the L stood for learner. Um, L Detachment were very mindful of their own drama. Um, they looked, dressed, and to a considerable extent, acted the part of swashbuckling desert warriors. Uh, and they took their cue really from the First World War, from Lawrence of Arabia and his, his kind of very romantic take on, on war. Um, everyone wore beards like this. The cover of Rogue Heroes, I, I've always thought uh, it, shows, it shows six soldiers just about to go into battle. And I've always thought it looks exactly like a rock band uh, <laughs> preparing to go on stage. They knew exactly the impact they were having because theirs was not just a military effect, it was a morale effect. They were under strict orders never to boast about their exploits, but then they really never needed to because others boasted for them. Um, and the exploits of, of the SAS quickly became the stuff of myth and legend. Um, they inflicted huge damage on Axis air power. They sapped German and Italian morale, and they tied up thousands of enemy soldiers defending the airfields who would otherwise have been deployed on the front line. In his diary, Rommel wrote that the SAS had inflicted considerable havoc. He said, Sterling's uh, men had, had caused more damage to us than any other unit. Now, there were a few people who understood the importance of military drama better than Winston Churchill. And you see him here uh, with his son, Randolph, a figure who's almost, been almost completely lost to history, but who plays a very important part in the SAS story. Now, Randolph was a most unlikely soldier. Uh, he was extremely overweight. Um, and in fact, he, uh, Sterling always joked that it was very hard to sort of push him through the hole uh, in, in the aircraft side to get him to actually parachute. But, but Sterling, uh, Randolph Churchill was a journalist. And like many journalists, he had a pretty vivid imagination. And, and Sterling worked out that if he could get Randolph involved in the SAS project, there was a high probability that Randolph would tell his father and that that would ensure the future of the SAS because it was in real trouble. And so he invited Randolph to take part in one of the least successful operations, not just of the North African campaign, but of the entire war. Um, and it was called um, Operation Bigamy. 
And the plan was very simple. Uh, Sterling decided that he would convert a, a, a staff car to look like a German vehicle, and you see it here. They called it the Blitz Buggy. And the idea was very simple. They would drive into occupied Benghazi, which was seething with Italian and German troops. They would then go down to the dock. They would then uh, inflate some inflatable kayaks and paddle out the shipping that was moored in the dock. Then they would blow it up with limpet mines and sink it, all the ships there so that it would block the mouth to Benghazi and prevent any uh, other shipping and, and supplies from coming in. It was a very simple idea. Um, and here you see them about to set off in the Blitz buggy. Now, a, a key figure who had to be brought along for this was a man called Fitzroy McLean. Uh, now, Fitzroy was brought along because uh, Fitzroy could speak Italian. And the guard posts around Benghazi were manned by Italians. Well, Fitzroy McLean could speak Italian, but it was a, only a sort of Italian because he had learnt his Italian studying Renaissance art. And so the Italian he spoke was a kind of weird 15th century sort of Rococo Italian. Um, and so as they approached the first uh, Italian checkpoint, uh, Fitzroy McLean addressed this astonished Italian in what must have sounded like sort of Dante. Um, Prithee, sire, wilt open yonder barrier so I and my companions may enter therewith. And, other. and I think the Italian was so astonished by this that he just sort of threw up the barrier and they drove in. Um, and they drove down to the dock, uh, and they got to the dock and discovered that both the inflatable kayaks had been punctured, so neither could be used. So they called off the operation, um, and there were, there were four of them on, on this operation. And as they were sort of marching out of, out of the harbor, they realized that instead of four, they had become six. Because two Italian soldiers, obviously thinking that some kind of weird military parade was taking place in the middle of the night, had joined the back of the line. Um, and so I think this was the only time in the war when Allied and Axis soldiers marched together in perfect harmony. Um, as they left, um, Fitzroy McLean, who was obviously completely high on adrenaline by this point, called out the Italian guard and dressed them down again in this bizarre Italian, uh, saying it's, it's, what you've done here is incredibly dangerous. There could be British saboteurs all over the place and you're all fired. Um, now, as I say, this was a, it was, the operation was a total failure. It had no impact whatever on the war, except that, as planned, Randolph did indeed write it up in a series of wonderfully vivid letters that he sent to his father. And that ensured the future of the SAS. Uh, Churchill was very taken by this kind of warfare. He loved swashbucklers. Um, and very soon after this, he was at a dinner party in Cairo on his way uh, to see Stalin when he met Sterling. And Sterling enchanted him with the stories of what they were up to. And the very next day, this is again from the archive, uh, Churchill's uh, secretary sent a note to Sterling saying, tell me what the SAS is about. Uh, Sterling replied with a kind of blueprint uh, for what special forces could be. And uh, it was really a power grab. It said, you know, vastly expand the size of the SAS and put me, David Sterling, in charge of it. Uh, but what you see in, in this document is really is a kind of blueprint for what all special forces thereafter really became. It's a rather a brilliant, brilliant idea, and it, and it worked. It ensured that the SAS future was safe. Um, I just very quickly want to tell you, I mean, the SAS by this point had developed techniques of desert survival that meant they could hang out in the desert for long, long periods, uh, dug into these, these sort of fortified um, desert encampments. But as I say, life expectancy was very short. And I just want to tell you one quick story about a man called Jack Silito, who, who represents a particular kind of bravery, I think. Um, Silito was with his unit trying to mine the railway at Tobruk uh, in October 1941, 42 now, when he was separated from his unit uh, and realized that he was completely on his own in the desert. And so he could either surrender to the Germans or he could try to walk back 130 miles across the desert to try and rejoin the unit in the desert. He chose the latter course. Uh, he had no water. Uh, he had a little receptacle, though. On the second day, uh, he began to drink his own urine, uh, which became steadily more concentrated as he, as he trudged through the desert. On the third day, his feet blistered and cracked. On the fourth day, his tongue swelled up. On the fifth day, he began to hallucinate. And on the sixth day, he saw in the distance a, a little convoy of jeeps. They were SAS. And he took off his shirt and set fire to it in an effort to try and attract their attention. They drove away across the horizon and disappeared. 
and he trudged on. He covered 130 miles and finally got to the desert encampment. And there are a series of extraordinary photographs of Silito the next day with his feet bandaged. Uh, Sterling believed that a, a week after this, Silito had completely recovered from the experience, um, which I think was not true, actually. I think Silito never fully recovered from it. Um, the second battle of El Alamein, uh, you see uh, General Montgomery here, who was the commander of the 8th Army, uh, was a turning point for, for the army. Montgomery had initially been very skeptical about Sterling's operations. He didn't, he didn't like what Sterling was up to. He said, the boy Sterling is mad, quite, quite mad. But in war, there is always a place for mad people. Um, they began to lose a lot of men, the SAS, towards the end of the war. And the reason for this, again, I found in the archives, was actually due to a spy. Um, the SAS was infiltrated by a man called Theodore Skirch, who was uh, an Italian, uh, he'd been recruited by Italian military intelligence, he was a very committed fascist. And one of the reasons why the SAS lost so many men was because, in fact, a lot of their positions were betrayed by Theodore Skirch, who was captured at the end of the war and tried, and was actually the only British soldier to be tried and executed for treason uh, in the course of the war. Uh, with the end of the war in the desert, um, the focus redeployed to Europe. The SAS was deeply involved in, in retaking Italy and in the fight for occupied France, but they were no longer under the command of David Sterling. Sterling was captured in the very last operation, last SAS operation of the Desert War, uh, and spent the rest of the war trying and failing to escape from various prisoners of war camp. Um, the unit now came under the command of Paddy Main. And the war entered a very different kind of phase because Hitler, by this point, passed something called the Commando Order. Now, the Commando Order was a direct response to what the SAS had been doing, and what it did was it effectively called for all captured SAS personnel to be executed immediately and without trial. Dozens, scores of SAS soldiers were simply murdered by the SS. Um, and in the final phase of the war, the SAS was vastly expanded. It played a vital role in, in D-Day, uh, parachuting behind the lines and, and really trying to prevent the panzer divisions from the south moving north uh, to reinforce the Normandy bridgehead. Um, SAS troops were among the first to enter Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. A, a scene of unbelievable horror greeted them there. Um, and there was an extraordinary moment. I, you may remember I mentioned Red Seekings, the one-eyed boxer at the beginning. Well, Red Seekings decided to take the law into his own hands and began to beat up an SS officer. Uh, he was stopped by his commanding officer who said, no, we must arrest these people. They must all be put on trial. And it's a very interesting moment because the SS could simply have executed every single one of those SS soldiers. But instead, they decided that they should be put on trial. And it's a little spark of humanity in what was otherwise an unbelievably brutal war. Um, sorry, that, that photograph you just saw, there was the commandant uh, under arrest who was then tried and executed. Um, the SAS idea expanded hugely after the war. It, it spread to France, to Belgium, to Australia, to New Zealand, and most importantly, to this country. Uh, US Delta Force was directly modeled on the SAS idea, and the ideas that Sterling came up with back in, in 1941 are still really the principles on which special forces operate today. And they are as important today as they've ever been, arguably more important than they've ever been. Uh, interestingly, the other day, um, the US Defense Secretary said of special forces operating in, in, in Syria, we want ISIS never to know who is coming through the window next. And that's a very, that's a very similar description to the way that Sterling approached this war. Um, to finish, uh, many things came to me while writing this, but, but one thing perhaps above all, that, that war, we have an idea of the Second World War that is written often in black and white, that there are heroes and villains, there are good people and bad people, there was a right side to be on and a wrong side to be on. Um, I've become increasingly convinced writing about this area that actually war is really painted in shades of grey. 
Uh, good people do bad things by mistake, um, or, or not by mistake. I mean, Paddy Main was not a bad man, but he was a killer. Uh, and, and, you know, there are, there, are, there are heroes on the other side, too. I, I, I wrestled with hero because I wasn't sure that, that I want... I mean, some of these men were incredibly heroic, but war itself is not heroic. War itself is incredibly nasty. And nobody really comes out of this story glorified. But yet it raises the question that I hope all good history raises, which is what would you do? And there's one final story I will tell you about, which is about a, a, a man called Sutton who parachuted into occupied France right at the end of the war. He was just a young man. He was a signaller. And he landed with three other companions. The other three were all executed. They were all captured immediately, and the other three were killed immediately. But he survived. And he told this incredible story after the war of personal survival, how he had been captured, he'd escaped, he'd fought off troops with a Bren gun. He'd, you know, and it was an amazing story. The problem with this story is that I don't think it was true. The truth is that Sutton actually, and this became clear at the, at the trials after the war of the people who had captured him, it is pretty clear that Sutton cooperated. Uh, that he agreed to work with the Germans to, you know, it's not quite clear how much he did, but he may even have given the locations of, of parachute landing drops. Now, when I, when I read this account, I was horrified, and I thought, well, I should really condemn this man. But actually, I couldn't bring myself to do that because I'm not at all sure that I wouldn't have done the same thing in that circumstance. If given the choice between being shot on sight and buried in a shallow grave, I would not also have tried to save my skin by feeding perhaps disinformation, but certainly trying to, trying to hold on to time. So I don't know that I wouldn't have done the same thing, but I do know that I would probably not have volunteered to parachute into occupied France in the first place. <laughs> so I guess my question, and I'll end with this thought, is what would you do? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, we, ha we certainly have some time for some questions. What, what time do we wind up? It's, we, got f we haven't got very long, I'm afraid. I've overrun. But do please ask any questions about this or any other subject that I can, that I can help with. Yes, sir. Hi. Thank you very much. I, I love all of your work. Thank you. I, uh, two questions. One about Rogue Heroes. Um, the, you, just that you, you brought that al so alive. Did they actually, I'll, I'll state both questions quickly. Did they actually think that they were going to be as accepted by the archaically-minded British military as they were. You, you did, did a great job with that, too. And um, on Operation Mincemeat, Me, um, did you have access to the same kind of archival materials for the, what was essentially an even more secret undertaking? Thank you. Um, the answer to the first question is, no, they did not accept, expect to be accepted. Uh, and, and Sterling was in constant battle with the higher brass. Uh, whom he, he referred to the sort of mid-levels of British uh, military bu bureaucracy as layer upon layer of fossilized shit. Um, <laughs> it, it was a phrase that he used repeatedly and sometimes in writing, so they knew exactly what he was, what he was talking about. Um, so no, they didn't expect to survive, and it was rather amazing that they did. Um, and they did so really by a certain amount of subterfuge too. I mean, Sterling essentially got away with it. And he wasn't the only private man running a sort of semi-private army. Um, on Operation Mincemeat, which is the deception operation that preceded the Sicilian invasion, which was a bizarre and, and rather wonderful story of using a dead body to try to ferry um, effectively lies to the German high command. Yes, I was incredibly lucky with that one because MI5 happened to release their archives it, much, it was an MI5 operation. MI5 is the, is the equivalent of the FBI. I mean, they are the internal security organization. But they were running the operation for reasons that are quite complicated. MI6 never releases its files. MI6, God bless them, does. Um, otherwise, I'd be out of a job. So they, they do me proud. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that Sterling spent the rest of the war trying to escape. What happened to him after the war? Well, his after-war story, like a lot of these soldiers, is actually rather a sad one in lots of ways. I mean, these, many of these men were people who thrived in war but really suffered in peace. And, and Sterling never really found a point to his life after the war. It had, it had been so exciting. He had been so young. He'd achieved so much that really uh, the SAS was, about, was disbanded after the war and then reformed again a year later. But by that point, Sterling was long out of the army. And, and 
many of them lived very sad afterlives, actually. They never quite adjusted to peacetime conditions. And Paddy Main was another one. I mean, he, he died incredibly young. He, he took to the drink and, and actually drove his car into a lamppost. I've never been sure whether he did that intentionally or not. But so, so Sterling's afterlife, which is often true, in fact, of, of people who have seen vivid action of this sort, was never quite the same again. Um, yes, ma'am. So you mentioned the cardboard boxes full of the archival materials that you worked with, and um, you probably worked with tons and tons of other material afterwards. Um, how much background research did you feel yourself having to do, and when did you finally say, okay, enough, I'll get to work? <laughs> it's a lovely question. The answer is I never quite get to the moment where I think I've done enough. Um, but the deadline, I can hear it sort of crunching up behind me, and I realize I'd better stop. Um, I, I got huge help from the SAS. They were wonderfully cooperative about all of this. I, I thought they would be tricky. I thought there might be elements of this story that they would want to take out. The only thing they wanted to take out was a, a graphic description of the death of one soldier, uh, and they wanted to take that out because it was going to upset the family, and I completely understood that. Um, I got a lot of help from them. In fact, this book could not have been written without the active participation of the SAS. They really, they really, they, let, they, they made it happen. Um, whether they will allow me to do a sequel, I strongly doubt, because um, after 1945, we end up in even murkier territory. Um, I'm afraid I've probably only got time for one more question, sir. Mr. McIntyre, uh, how important do you believe the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain is for um, world security today? Wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a question I could do a lot more than two minutes on. It's still absolutely vital. Um, it, it is still the strongest and most important of the relationships, particularly in, a, in, an, in an era of when signals intelligence, um, which was so important during the Second World War and is now obviously digital and to do with mobiles and so on, is absolutely vital. And, and the relationship between GCHQ, which is our equivalent, in Britain of the, of, the, of the signals intelligence is absolutely vital. So I would argue it's probably never been more special um, or, or more important. Or, and that is true of intelligence generally. I mean, w we imagine, don't we, that somehow you know, war has moved on, but actually human intelligence and signals intelligence are absolutely the core of all of our freedoms and, and have been for a very long time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.